This is KGW News at 11. Safety of my life is more so why I do my gun, was because who knows what could have happened. It was a split second decision pulling a gun on a would be robber, but that decision got this former plaid pantry clerk fired. This surveillance video has a lot of people talking, so the robber had a hatchet. Little did he know the clerk had a gun and tonight that now former clerk talked to KGW's Catherine Cook about his decision to willfully break company rules here. Catherine. Well, Dan, he says he did it for one reason to protect himself, but he hoped it wouldn't come to that. Still, he knew this was going to be his last night at work for one reason or another. I was scared like for my life what could be happening. It's what Christopher Fallis was thinking in this surveillance video when a masked man slides a hatchet knife his way. Fallis was working the night shift at this Oak Grove plaid pantry when it happened. A moment he came to work prepared for. Saw him pull out a hatchet as he approached the front counter. Uh, I, within a second, drew my gun. Wallace is 45. Watch as the mere sight of it brings the would-be robber to his knees, then sends him out the door. He never said anything besides the, I'm sorry, I'll leave because I drew my gun at, like almost immediately as soon as I saw the hatchet. Fallis has a concealed weapons permit. What he didn't have that night was permission to use his gun at work. Plaid Pantry has a strict no weapons policy for its employees. I already knew as soon as I drew the gun, I was getting fired. He was right. Plaid Pantry fired Fallis. In a statement to KGW, a spokesman for Plaid Pantry said in part, the company makes significant investments in security equipment and training in robbery deterrence and violence prevention. All employees are trained in these procedures and receive ongoing refresher training. In the event a robbery does occur, the focus shifts entirely to non-resistance cooperation and violence avoidance for the safety of our employees and customers. What is going on? Paulus's like, girlfriend disagrees. I think you should be able to protect yourself in situations like this. I completely understand. I broke company policy, but... Like, yeah, it upsets me that I lost my job. Paulus hopes he can find a new one. Times are tough, but he stands by what he did. Your life's not worth a minimum wage job. A lot of companies have no weapons policies. We called 7-Eleven tonight. A clerk there told us that includes them. By the way, the guy with the hatchet knife is still out there. If you have any information on this case, you're asked to call the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. Back to you. Thank you, Catherine. Court documents filed today in the case of a missing Salem mother and her three year old son show prosecutors believe the two are likely dead. Their bodies, however, have not been found. The new information comes as their suspected killer, Michael Wolf, appeared in court. Wolf is the boy's biological father. A probable cause affidavit obtained by KGW News lays out a timeline based on cell phone records. Those put Wolf and Carissa Fretwell in the same place at the same time the day she and her son Billy disappeared. There's also surveillance video from Wolf's work that showed him leaving during his shift and returning several hours later carrying a trash bag. Detectives say the evidence doesn't line up with Wolf's story. It's certainly tragic, the loss of a young woman and her small child. Uh, that's horribly tragic. Um, but looking at the faces of the family wanting answers to questions that we don't have the answers yet, that's the really hard part. Crews, meanwhile, have not given up the search for Carissa and Billy. They're still focused on a rural area of Yamhill County. New tonight, a frustrating case of vandalism in Tigard. A homeowner there says someone pulled down his American flag, ripped it apart, and then left it in the street. And all of this happened on Memorial Day. KGW's Mike Benner has the story. It just doesn't happen in this neighborhood. Since moving into his Tigard home two years ago, Mark Scholes has proudly flown an American flag out front. After all, both his grandfathers and father served our country. On Memorial Day, I think that is the best symbol we can put out, along with many other days throughout the year. But yes, I, I feel strongly for my grandfathers and my father in their service. Mark also feels strongly about what he woke up to on Memorial Day morning. Five or six pieces of the flag, the profanity ridden, and arrows pointed in the driveway. Mark shared these photos with KGW. They show his American flag ripped apart and nasty messages written on the street and mailbox calling him a capitalist swine. Although you have the right to free speech, you do not have the right to damage my personal property 
as a form of your free speech. You do not have the right to desecrate the flag in that way. Making matters even worse, as Mark cleaned up the vandalism, he learned this may not be the first time someone has disrespected his flag. Several regular neighbors walk up and down the street regularly, and one of the gentlemen walked up and said, by the way, I've seen your flag on the ground three or four times and picked it up as if someone took it out and threw it on the ground. In an effort to avoid any more problems, Mark is planning to move his new flag to the top of a tall pole behind a secure gate. He also left this message for the person or people responsible for the vandalism. We live in an amazing country with amazing privileges and rights. And yet you don't, and you have the right to speak your mind, but you don't have the right to destroy another person's personal property. Mark, of course, filed a police report. He says officers are checking in with some nearby agencies to see if they're dealing with any similar reports. In the meantime, if you know anything about what happened here, you should contact Tigard Police. Reporting in Tigard, I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. A man accused of assaulting a police officer is in custody tonight after leading police on a chase. The chase ended about 5 o'clock tonight in a crash in Beaverton just off 170th Avenue. The suspect was the only person in the van you see there in the trees. He was taken to the hospital with minor injuries. The man was wanted for assaulting an officer in Columbia City. Several different agencies tried to catch him. He led police from Highway 30 onto Logie Trail Road in northwest Portland, then onto Highway 26. Washington County Sheriff's deputies eventually got him to stop. He's one of the Northwest most well known criminals and today we learned the man known as the barefoot bandit will not get out of probation early. A federal judge denied Colton Harris Moore's request to end his probation five months early. He was sentenced in 2012 to seven years in prison for his cross country crime spree that began in 2008. He's suspected in at least 100 different thefts, many times barefoot in Washington, Idaho and Canada. Along the way, he stole boats, cars, even planes, taught himself how to fly. And get this, the 38-year-old told the judge he wants to become a motivational speaker to help him pay the $1.3 million he owes in restitution. There are just five weeks left in the Oregon legislative session this year, and things have slowed down to a crawl. Here's why. Of the 10's choice to facilitate the sale or sublease allowed under RS 90.555, that doesn't sound like a crawl, but here's what's going on. Republican House members have started insisting that instead of summarizing bills, which is typical on the House floor, every word of every bill must now be read out loud. And that's why the clerk was reading so fast to get through all the bills. They're full of legal jargon and can run dozens of pages. The longest so far covered 62 pages and took three days to read. The bill reading has slowed everything down. Tonight, 91 bills are backed up and waiting. We talked to the Republican leader behind the move. We are playing for time, and we're looking for those opportunities that we have to affect this session positively for our rural constituents before we get out of here. Republicans started this delay tactic after the massive education funding bill passed over their objections. To agree to speed things up, they're asking for more compromises, but wouldn't tell us what specifically. More severe weather rocking the Midwest tonight. A tornado that some described as the largest they'd ever seen ripped through Kansas City. Chief Meteorologist Matt Zafino has a closer look at that storm and the damage it caused, Matt. Yeah, it's unbelievable. There have been at least eight, report, uh, eight tornadoes reported. For each of the last 12 days, that really is impressive. Tonight it was Kansas City, Missouri uh, under the gun for severe weather and severe storms. Look at this video of this tornado. It looks absolutely massive. Now, this is what we call rain wrapped. The tornado itself is in the middle of that giant, massive area of rain. So the tornado isn't as big as it appears here, but still that is a really impressive thunderstorm that spawned a tornado that hit very close to Kansas City, the Kansas City metro area. It's about 2 million people it was spared a direct hit. A tornado emergency had been issued by the Weather Service there because of the fear that one would go very close to the very populated areas of the city, but it did miss it. However, on the outskirts, Lawrence, Kansas, about 40 miles to the west, home of the University of Kansas, uh, had uh, about a dozen people admitted to the hospitals there. And look at the damage there. I mean, these homes look like they were dollhouses, just completely ripped apart with the roofs torn off. They had to, and then uh, farther to the north and east in Ohio, for example, they had to use snow plows to clear the damage out of the roadways. Now, let me show you the tornado reports back in Kansas City. One, two, three, four, five, six, about, you know, over a dozen reports of tornadoes. Some of those are from the same tornado, but still 
really brutal. And you know what? It wasn't just the Midwest. Now the Northeast. We had a tornado touchdown in New Jersey. There was a tornado warning for parts of New York City. Big hail, almost two inches uh, in diameter on Staten Island and way out on Long Island as well. So it's not just the Midwest right now. The Northeast got hammered with strong thunderstorms too. We had thunderstorms in Oregon as well. Not severe, but strong. I've got a beautiful picture to show you of that. And of course, the rest of our forecast in a bit. Back to you. All right, Matt, we'll talk to you again soon. Also still ahead, all in a day's work for a local sheriff's deputy, how they helped free a peacock. Plus, some Longview students volunteered to get bumped off their flight, so the airline gave them gift cards. Now the school wants them to hand those over. I find myself shaking my head and smiling at the same time because I'm baffled by the situation. It doesn't make sense to me. And later, local adventurer Colin O'Brady weighs in on the dangers facing climbers on Mount Everest as the peak keeps getting more and more crowded.